<laughs> All right, is everybody ready to go? Yeah, good to go. Yes, thank you. All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the beautiful kingdom of Lily here in the greatest nation on earth. Another Brisbane winter has delivered for us today. I'm very happy to welcome the acting prime minister, Richard Miles, to the electorate of Lily to discuss aged care issues with our very dedicated aged care workers who join us in the park this morning, uh, following on from the Australian government's submission to Fair Work last night and Aged Care Worker Day on Sunday. So I'll start by handing over to our acting prime minister. Well, thank you, Annika, and it's great to be here with Annika Wells, our fantastic Minister for Aged Care, and of course uh, here as the local member, the member for Lilly. Uh, let me first start by uh, expressing uh, the government's deep sadness about the passing of Olivia Newton-John. Uh, for people of my generation who grew up watching Greece, uh, this feels like the end of an era. It feels like the world is a little emptier without Olivia Newton-John as a part of it. She has been a mainstay of our lives as an iconic Australian entertainer who has made such a significant contribution to the entertainment industry, not just in this country, but around the world. But of course, Olivia Newton-John has done much more than that. Um, in establishing the Olivia Newton-John Foundation, uh, which has raised money for research in cancer, she has left a huge legacy. Uh, which is benefiting so many people who have suffered from cancer. Uh, there's an, an enormous tragedy, obviously, in her own passing, but through her experience and her advocacy, uh, she has advanced the cause of cancer research, which has benefited thousands upon thousands of people who will uh, be the, much the better for the outcomes of that research and on behalf of the Australian Government we certainly pass on all our condolences to Olivia Newton-John's family and, and friends. Um, yesterday afternoon the Government lodged its submission uh, for a meaningful wage increase for those who work in aged care. This is a really important commitment that we made prior to the last election. It's a commitment that we are now fulfilling. Seeing a meaningful wage increase for those in aged care uh, fulfils also one of the recommendations of the Royal Commission uh, into aged care. Those who work in, in, in aged care, we ask them to do such a critically important job. We're asking people to look after our loved ones in the final years of their life. And for those of us who have loved ones in aged care, we know that those workers become part of our family, that we have a sense of faith and trust that they are caring for our loved ones is so important to our own lives. Uh, it is a really meaningful job and it requires a meaningful wage increase because right now people are not being paid uh, appropriately for the work that they are doing. Now this is a matter of justice, it's a matter of fairness for those who work in aged care, but it's also really important in terms of making sure that we are retaining the workforce in aged care and more importantly that we are encouraging people to take up a career by working in, in, in aged care. So we are really proud of the submission that we've made um, and we now look forward to the work of the Commission in determining this case. Uh, and I might hand over to our aged care minister to speak more about this. Uh, thank you, Acting PM. You would have seen on Sunday that it was Aged Care Worker Day. And we have some aged care workers here with us this morning who, as many of you would know, because many of you have loved ones in aged care yourself, are some of the hardest working, most dedicated, and most underpaid and therefore most vulnerable workers in Australia. We have stories of people who spend decades looking after our older Australians, but their work is so insecure that they have to live in a caravan. And that is not a standard of worker condition that this government is prepared to accept. 
because it does not give us a standard of care that Australians want for older Australians in both residential facilities and in home care. That's why we were so pleased to be able to follow on from Aged Care Worker Day with our submission to the Fair Work Commission looking for a meaningful and significant pay rise for aged care workers because the complexity of their work has increased significantly, not just through COVID but from the kind of standard of care that we are asking them to give older Australians in the years and decades to come. So I wanted to use this moment to say thank you very much for everything that you have done and that after many, many years of traipsing to Canberra, walking the halls, feeling like nobody had listened to them, they got to see the very first bill through the House, through the Parliament, be a bill for aged care reform. I would note with some bafflement that the Shadow Finance Minister yesterday, when discussing this important submission about getting a well-earned and meaningful pay rise for aged care workers, asked how is it going to be paid for? Was that going to flow on to ordinary Australians? And I think that really bells the cat on the lack of commitment to aged care reform even now, even approaching 10 weeks after an election where Australians voted for change in aged care. For nine years we had neglect, for nine years we had no meaningful reform and you know that because the Royal Commission said in its final report it appears that the Morrison government tried to do as very little as possible as they could get away with by way of reform and instead of taking that lesson from the final report, instead of taking the lessons from Australians voting at polling booths across the country 10 weeks ago, yesterday they still said, how are you going to pay for it? The cost of not acting here is too much. And when every single person wants to walk in the door and talk to me about workforce shortages, the idea that the opposition would say paying workers more is not a, a worthy and meaningful policy to try and increase workers to a very important industry absolutely blows the mind. Are there any questions? Is, is, is it not a fair question though for the opposition to ask where the funding will come in? It's not fair because 10 weeks ago this was very much their problem that they were doing nothing about. These aren't new workforce shortages, these aren't newly underpaid workers, these are people who could earn more stacking shelves at Woolies that that government and now that opposition knew about for nine years and did nothing about. The problem that we are facing now is wildly exacerbated because of their neglect across years. They had nine budgets to do something about aged care reform, they had nine budgets to find what they might find to be a sustainable way to pay for pay rises and they didn't. In fact the very first thing they did, in, well one of the very first things they did in December 2013 when the Abbott government came to power was suspend standing orders in the House to cut the Aged Care Workforce Compact, a workforce compact that would have given a pay rise to aged care workers. One of the very first things they did was cut aged care pay. So yes, I can understand that they appear baffled by the idea that a government might have to pay for pay rises, but I can't believe after everything we have all been through as a country, the interim report, the final report, the election, that they still don't understand this is what Australians want to do, what Australians want their government to fix, and specifically the cost of not doing this is tenfold. Yeah. Complex answer that I'll distill down is that this uh, decision by the Fair Work Commission will affect a number of different awards and so it will affect lots of different groups of workers within the broader aged care sector. The funding model is a bit more complex than that. The decision by the Fair Work Commission will affect the modern awards and the enterprise bargaining agreements that sit within 
aged care and that will be quite transparent. You'll be able to see what those fees are and one of the measures that we are introducing that will pass through the House and I hope will be in effect before the end of the year is greater transparency and accountability. So you'll be able to see much more raw data available online about what different residential facilities are spending their money on. So I think you'll see an increase in transparency and accountability overall. Um, what was the first part of your question? Well, I'd point you to the um, funding model that we just put through the House that has put a 10% uplift in funding from the government to flow towards um, all of the elements of aged care, whether that be um, food, whether that be care minutes. Um, and there'll be more to come as we deliver more reform, um, hopefully in the September or November sittings. What about um, education and talk about the work Some of the funding we use to offer this kind of contract 12 students, 11 students to, mm. to get into the aged care Yeah, I'd point you to a number of the election commitments that Labor made that will help this complex problem. So we've got the um, additional hex places for areas that have skill shortages. We've got the fee-free TAFE places. Both of those are to incentivise pathways to give us more nurses, more personal carers into, enter into aged care because this is a broader problem. This is a, the problem care economy wide. This is aged care, this is veterans, this is the NDIS, this is the care economy. Economy. So we have a number of different election commitments that flow across a number of different portfolios designed to increase um, both the pathways available to people and to um, reward it more. Because like I've said before, I actually believe this is a cultural problem. We as a country do not value care enough. When we talk about the kind of care that personal care um, care workers give in aged care facilities, I think that you know one of the reasons that we put this submission in is because the emotional intelligence that you need when and navigating someone with dementia or who has a, a normal routine and has just moved into a residential facility for the first time, you know, that is a skill that they bring that I don't think is adequately recognised or remunerated at the moment. And until we value care more, we're not going to have people who want to do that care work feel like their country recognises the complexity and meaningfulness of what they do. So that's why not only are we putting a submission into Fair Work to try and get a meaningful pay rise, to try and get a significant pay rise, but people like me and people like Richard are going uphill and down Dale to tell our aged care workers, we value you. Thank you. We value you and we thank you for everything that you've done and we want you to stay there and we want more people to join you. Acting Prime Minister, can I just go? Sorry, I'll just go oh, next to Sorry, I have a question for Acting Prime Minister. Sure. No, you <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask, is Australia nowhere in the world that we've got this country 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 that we've got this uh, in regards to the triple C here in Queensland. Uh, the governors will be conceded that there will be some, um, some findings by the federal inquiry that will deal negatively on the triple C. We know that the, the federal government has always wanted to have a federal watchdog. Will the federal government today be looking at the findings of the triple C to, I guess, educate itself on, on, on perhaps having this federal watchdog? Because there will be some, some very, I guess, negative findings here today. Uh, well, look, I'm, I won't comment on uh, the specific findings of the, the Triple C, and I'll leave that to uh, the government here in Queensland. Um, we, we have made a commitment to introducing an anti-corruption commission at a federal level, um, and that is a, a very significant commitment that we took to the last election, and it's, and it's one that we intend to pursue with vigour. Uh, now, in, in informing ourselves about the precise model, we're obviously uh, having a look at the various models which exist around the states, including here in Queensland, and, and all the learnings from that will inform us as to what is the best way in which to uh, implement the commitment to have an anti-corruption commission at a federal level. It's certainly concerning, though, that some of these findings are suggesting that officers acted outside of the law, that people were questioned when they should have been questioned. And is being funded by the government it's an exorbitant amount of money and yet they haven't had they haven't had that many convictions. So it's surely it's a concerning issue. Well, well, again, I'll, I'll leave commentary on that to the, the Queensland government here. As I say, in terms of meeting our own commitment to introducing an anti-corruption commission, we are looking at the various models and the various experiences around the states.
What we uh, want to see is a reduction in tensions um, and a de-escalation of activity uh, in the Taiwan Strait. Um, that we need to be seeing a return to normality and more peaceful activity in the Taiwan Strait. That's obviously uh, what serves uh, the interests of the region. It's clearly what serves Australia's national interest. But to be frank, it's what the world, I think, is seeking right now. Uh, we need to see a de-escalation in the tensions around the Taiwan Strait. And I really believe the world would breathe a sigh of relief as soon as that happens. Uh, I, I think given the, the circumstances of all that's led here, I think people would understand that um, it, it's, it's not appropriate for me to be commenting on this. Um, is there Last question for Minister Wills. Is that sure. Um, do we have a ballpark figure on how much the rate rise could cost? Ooh, we have lots of different modelling about that, but um, it's all hypothetical because it's ultimately um, for the Commission to decide what percentage pay rise it is. And then following on from that, um, they've foreshadowed that there'll be the opportunity for both the government and other parties, like the unions who've made submissions to this matter, to talk about the sequencing of that. You might remember that the community workers case back during the Rudd, gov uh, Rudd Gillard government years that gave a significant pay rise to our community workers was stepped out across nine years. So the sequencing around that, there's lots more work to do. And um, yes, we're preparing, um, I guess, for all eventualities, but until we have the figure from the commissioner and what figure he's attri um, attributing to different sections of the aged care workforce, it's all hypothetical. Is there, is there a number that would be... If, if Was there a last question about support? Um, and then we've got to go. If the Fair Work Commission, is there a number where the Fair Work Commission will come back to you and you say that's too low and you guys will fund it above that? Is there, is there a flaw? The reason we're going to the Fair Work Commission is because they are an independent quali qualified arbiter who, can, arbiter who can assess the significant work value complexity increase and we look forward to his decision across the summer. Beautiful, thank you. G'day, how are you? I'm Richard. Hi. Richard. G'day, how are you? G'day. I'm sorry. You have a very powerful speech from workplace relations. Uh, not right now, no. You don't want to go? No. Nope. 